Hello everybody. Thank you for checking out this video. I really do appreciate it. I am your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete and this is my movie series Nails in a Coffin. I do a kill analysis in slasher horror movies and I rate the, the victim's deaths on a scale of one nail in the coffin to four nails in a coffin. A one nail rating is going to be where the victim makes a lot of dumb decisions before they die like not double tapping or running upstairs instead of running outside and my scale goes up to four nails. A four nail death is where the victim fought hard, didn't make any dumb decisions, or they sacrificed themselves for a better cause. They're going to get four nails in a coffin because more nails are better. And with great kills, there must also come great nails. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, none other than the 1996 slasher movie, Scream, directed by horror icon, may he rest in peace, Wes Craven. This movie did revitalize the slasher genre in the 90s, and it was often imitated, and a lot of movies never really even lived up to what this movie did for the slasher genre. This movie had a pretty much star-studded cast of you know 90s actors. We had Nev Campbell, Courtney Cox, David Arquette, Rose McGowan, Jamie Kennedy, Skeet Ulrich, Matthew Lillard, Drew Barrymore, Liev Shriver, and Harry Winkler also better known as the Fonz. The first kill and scream happens at just 12 minutes in, and it, the character's name is Casey Becker, played by Drew Barrymore. When this movie initially came out, it really shocked a lot of fans that Drew Barrymore was killed at just 12 minutes in because all the trailers and promotional material, you know, bill Drew Barrymore as one of the top stars in the movie. So, very clever uh, way of starting a movie by Wes Craven. Casey is home at night, making some popcorn on the stove, and she gets a phone call from Ghostface. Hello? She thinks it's the wrong number. She's really polite to the person, you know, very nice to them. And she ends the conversation, but Ghostface keeps calling back, and Casey's pretty nice. She's very polite, talking to them, just kind of small talk and whatnot. And this goes on for a little while. The more and more it goes on, you know, the viewer, you start to feel a little bit more and more uncomfortable because you can imagine what's going to happen next. Casey is increasingly, increasingly getting more and more upset with all the phone calls because, you know, the way the killer is, you know, harassing her on the phone. And then he shows her that he has her boyfriend tied up. He's all bloody. Casey's really, really upset. And the killer finally says to her, Don't you listen, you little bitch. You hang up on me again, I'll gut you like a fish, understand? And this is where you see the terror in Casey, so really well done by Drew Barrymore. The killer kills her boyfriend off screen. He was already tied up, so I'm really not going to rate it because I didn't see really what led up to it. You know, she starts to lock all the doors in the house, so she's being smart right there. And then, you know, she grabs a knife from the kitchen, so she is ready to defend herself. So she's making smarter and smarter decisions. But eventually, you know, she wants to run for it because the killers, you know, get trying to get in the house. She got out of the house and she was she had a knife in her hand and she was trying to run away because she sees her parents uh, in their car pulling up the long, long driveway because they live out in the middle of nowhere on this large piece of land. So she sees her parents driving up and she starts to run, but she stops when she sees them like it wasn't to catch her breath or nothing. She could have, you know, kept running and sprinting. Well, Ghostface is there, catches up to her, you know, from behind, grabs her and stabs her in the chest. He, you know, he's toying with her. He doesn't kill her right away. He's dragging her around to the point now where Casey is on the phone. The parents came home, saw the house in disarray because of Ghostface was running in there. The popcorn was on fire on the stove. And the parents like, okay, we got to call the cops because we can't find Casey. They pick up the phone, and Casey has the other phone in her hand, and the mom hears Casey's final breath when Ghostface stabs her to death. And then a short while later, after he kills her, he strings her up in a tree, hanging her on display for the parents to see. Casey, you made some smart decisions. You know, you tried to lock the house. You know, you tried to defend yourself with the knife or whatnot. But you stopped running a couple times when you probably could have kept on running. You could have made some more smart decisions. So I'm going to go right down the middle, Casey, and give you two nails in a coffin for the first kill in Scream. Again, this really shocked fans. But let's see what else we have for nails in a coffin. So on to our next kill. 
our next kill happens at 53 minutes into the movie, so a, a little bit later on, and a lot has happened. Even somebody was in high school with the ghost face costume pulling pranks. So our next death was Principal Himby, played by Henry Winkler, better known as the Fonz. Hey! And, um, you know, he's kind of locking up for the afternoon, and he's kind of creeped out because of, you know, the murders and whatnot, and they're threatening his students. So he's kind of creeped out, you know, and he's acting suspicious, looking for people, you know, checking closets and whatnot, looking around. And he goes back into his office, looking in the closet. Nothing's there, but he's really on edge. And, he, you know, he, he's pretty much thinking to himself, like, hey, you know, I'm just freaking out. You know, everything is calm. Nothing's going to happen. Well, he didn't check one place, and it is behind his office door. So when he, the ghost face jumps out from behind the office door, before the principal can really even react, Ghostface takes a knife and starts just slashing him in the gut and then gets him down on the floor and stabs him to death. He didn't really have a lot of time to react. He was checking around, but he did miss checking behind the door. Didn't have a lot of a reaction time, so I'm going to do the same thing with Casey and go right down the middle and give Fonzie a two nails in the coffin for his death as Principal Hinby. Now, right before Principal Hinby dies, there's a really cool shot. It's probably my favorite shot in the whole movie, yeah, how well it was done. I love the cinematography of it. Uh, the principal is lying on the ground. He's been stabbed, but he's not dead yet. He's looking up, and Ghostface is standing over him. And then the camera zooms in on, on you know, pr the principal's eye, and you see Ghostface reflection in the principal's iris. And it's just, it's so well done, and it's a pretty beautiful yet terrifying shot. So, yeah, really enjoyable, very well done here by Wes Craven and the cinematographer. Our next death happens at one hour and seven minutes in, and it is Tatum, who is Sydney's best friend, played by Rose McGowan. Right now, most of the class is at this big party at Stu's house, who is Tatum's boyfriend. And again, he lives in his big mansion like everybody does in this movie. And they're at the party. Tatum goes into the garage to get some beer out of the refrigerator in there. She's startled by a cat going out through this pet flap in the garage door, which is going to play into her death. So she's in a garage, and Ghostface surprises her in there. So she sees someone standing there at the top of the stairs to the door in a Ghostface costume, and she automatically assumes it's Stu or somebody else just playing a joke on her even though her best friend was attacked by somebody wearing this costume, and two other students in her class were also murdered by somebody wearing this costume. But she assumes that the person is just joking with them, so she's messing with them until Ghostface grabs her arm and cuts it with a knife. So then she finally realizes, oh shit, I'm in trouble, and she tries to get away by opening the garage door, but Ghostface closes it before she can get out from underneath it. She actually puts up a pretty decent fight with Ghostface. She's throwing beer bottles at him. You know, she trips him, flips him over a little bit, you know, trying to get away. Then she makes a very, very dumb decision. To get out, she decides to try and climb through the pet flap in the garage door. Ghostface pretty much has an easy job up right now at this point because he just opens the garage door. It picks up Tatum, carrying her all the way up to the top. Which, again, I find weird because I don't know any garage door that can hold up 100, 110 pounds, whatever she weighed, you know, and be able to put enough force to, you know, break their body and kill them. So, as I said, she climbs through the flap, goes face, opens the garage door. It goes all the way up and kills her. Even though she put up a decent fight with him, I'm still going to give her one now in the coffin because she had too much stupid to make up, you know, from the fight that she had. The garage had rakes, sticks, had all kinds of stuff that she could have used as a weapon. and But she didn't decide to do anything. She decided to try and get out through a small, tiny door that most people probably couldn't fit through. So even though you put up a decent fight there, Tatum, you're only going to get one nail in the coffin for that decision of trying to go through the pet door. Kenny is the next to go at an hour and 20 minutes in. Kenny is Gail Weathers, played by Courtney Cox. She's a reporter. Kenny is her cameraman. The cameraman is uh, sitting inside his news van right now, looking at the party going on inside. He's got um, a live feed camera he stuck inside the house 
so they can, you know, watch the party and everything because, you know, Gail Weathers wanted to get a scoop on these ghost face killings. Now, there's about a 30-second delay to what Kenny is seeing from inside the house. Nev, right now, has been attacked by Ghostface again at the party, and she's trying to get away. She makes it to Kenny in the van, and they jump back inside the van, slide the door shut, and they're watching to see what's going on inside the house. They see uh, Randy, played by Jamie Kennedy, laying on the couch. He's drunk and stoned, and Ghostface is standing over him. So Kenny, immediately, you think he's going to go help, so he jumps out of the van to go run in the house, but then he stops, looks back inside the van, and as soon as he turns around, Ghostface surprises him, slashes him in the throat, and kills him. I, I'm kind of on the fence with Kenny here because he did try and go help. You know, he was about to go run in the house, but he saw the delay, so then he stopped to go look in. Two nails in the coffin for Kenny. He could have done some stuff differently. They could have stayed in the van, driven away, went to go get help. If he knew Randy was in trouble, he should have kept running into the house instead of stopping. I'm going to give Kenny two nails in the coffin because he did try and, you know, he was surprised. So I believe two nails is fair for Kenny. We're now at the final of the movie at an hour and 40 minutes in, just a few more deaths to go. One hour and 40 minutes in, Stu is to next to die. He is played by Matthew Lillard and is the best friend to Billy Loomis, played by Skeet Ulrich. At this point in the movie, Stu and Billy have done a bunch of exposition to Sydney, letting her know that they're the ones who killed everybody, why they killed them, why they're targeting Sydney, because Sydney's mom slept with Billy's, Billy's dad, which caused Billy's mama to leave. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. Billy and Stu, really stupid, doing, A, doing all this exposition, letting Sydney know, you know, what they're going to do and why they did it. They just killed her right away. Their plan would have succeeded, most likely. And they make the brilliant, dumb decision to play knifey, stabby game with each other to make it look like they had defensive wounds from Sydney's dad since they were going to frame him for all the murders so far. And they kind of go too deep sometimes with some of the stabs because Stu even says, I feel a woozy air. Being that dumb, making decisions to, you know, stab each other like that when they just could have, you know, slashed at each other and not actually stabbed to cause internal injuries. Well, those dumb decisions, it weakened them since they had lost some blood and, you know, they were more vulnerable since they had these wounds. So as Stu is chasing Sydney around the house, he gets on top of her, knocks him in the head with the Voss, and he's lying on the ground. Now, again, he's weakened because of the stabs and whatnot. And Sydney takes a TV that was on a shelf over Stu's head and pushes it down on him. He sees the TV, and he even, like, you know, shakes his hands and screams, but... He doesn't try and block it, cover his head, or anything. So, for that alone, I probably would have given Stu one nail in the coffin, but you made dumb decisions leading up to it, trying to, you know, do all this exposition to Sydney and everything when you could have killed her right away, and you may have gotten away with it. So, Stu, for all that dumbness, and the fact that you probably could have put your hands up, or at least, you know, try to cover your head from the TV falling, you had some time, one nail in the coffin, Stu. Billy is our final kill in the movie, and it happens at an hour and 42 minutes in. He has been fighting and wrestling around with Sydney. He's trying to kill her. She's trying to get away. He has her down on the ground, and you know she pushes into one of his stab wounds that he got from Stu, and it you know kind of gets him off of her throat. And then Gail shows up with the gun and shoots Billy, knocking him off of Sydney, and he's rolling down to his side, presumably dead. He kind of stops moving for a while, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, Gail and Sydney are talking to each other, and Jamie is there, and Jamie is the meta character in the movie that tells everybody, to, you know, the rules of horror movies, and as he's telling Sydney and Gail that this is the moment in a horror movie where, you know, the killer does one final gasp to try and get at the end when, you know, they think he's dead. As soon as he says this, comically kind of, um, Billy springs back up, jumping at Sydney, and she puts a bullet in his head. So, for sure, he's dead. 
Billy, you're getting one nail in the coffin for the same reason that I gave your best friend Stu one nail in the coffin. You chose to stab each other when you probably could have just slashed each other to get these wounds to make it look like defensive wounds or whatnot. And you wouldn't have both weakened yourselves, you know, in the final act because Sydney got you off of her because she pushed on one of your stab wounds. And the same thing happened to Stu. So for doing that, grandstanding is another reason why you're dead now, Billy. All that grandstanding and stupidity, yeah, you're getting one nail in the coffin. There we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Those are my nails in the coffin ratings for all the on-screen kills in 1996's Scream, directed by horror icon. May he rest in peace, Wes Craven. I will be covering the other movies in the franchise. Now, I don't remember liking those as much, but it has been a few years since I have seen them, so we'll see how I feel on my rewatches for Nails in a Coffin. I want to thank you very much for checking out this video. It means a lot to me that you know, you've stuck it in this far and you're still watching. Thank you. You're an awesome person. And if you haven't already, please give me a like down below and give me a comment. Let me know what you thought. You know, do you agree with me? Disagree with me? Let, let me know what you would have given some of these kills. I hope you guys enjoy yourselves. Stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy. I am your friendly neighborhood, Uncle Pete. And remember, with great kills, there must also come great nails.